Motivation matters. If you don't believe that, then husbands, when Valentine's Day rolls around in just about a week, tell your wife that the only reason you're taking her out is because you have to. And then please, please let me know how that goes for you. You know, when we were kids, sometimes we were told by our parents when we had done something wrong to our brother or sister, go apologize to your sister. Go apologize to your brother. And, and, and maybe we obeyed. And when we offered that apology to our sister, I, I, I'm sorry, sister. I'm, I'm sorry, brother. Did we mean it? No, we were just trying to avoid getting whipped. You see, motivation matters. At the same time, even today, it's easy for us to lose motivation. It's easy for us to lose that fire. It's easy for us to grow complacent. It's easy for us to just start going through the motions of worship. It's easy for us, if you will, to settle for mediocrity in our worship. In fact, there's a, there's a football coach that I really, really like. I won't name, uh, name his name, but he coaches at a school east of the Mississippi that's red and white, and we will say nothing more about that. That he said once that mediocrity is the human condition. And I think he's right, because it's so easy for us in every aspect of our life to settle for mediocrity. But God deserves more than mediocre worship. He deserves more than half-hearted praise. God demands that we worship Him with purpose. But how can we today worship God with purpose? Well, that brings us to our main text today here in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 tells us there in the text, as Isaiah puts the people of Judah on trial for their lack of faithfulness to God, he begins there in verse 1 by saying, the vision concerning Judah in Jerusalem that Isaiah the son of Amos saw during the reigns of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah. You know, overall, this time period when Isaiah prophesied was a period of Usual great prosperity for the people of God. They were rich. Their borders in some cases were expanding. They were fabulously blessed. And yet, despite their prosperity, they were sick. They were weak. And their hearts were rotten. And so Isaiah turns to the people of God here in the text, and he's going to challenge them here in Isaiah chapter 1. To worship God with purpose. There's a lot we can learn from what Isaiah has to say to the people of God here in Isaiah chapter 1. Because physically here in America, breaking news, we are rich. And we gather with other believers many times every Sunday. And we pray prayers, we sing songs, we listen to a sermon but all the while, as we sing these songs and pray these prayers, it's easy for us to think that God is pleased and we, we go on our merry way. But is God pleased? Is God pleased when we come to worship just to check off a few boxes and, and go back home to eat our lunches, get our Sunday afternoon naps? Or does God expect more? You see, worshiping with purpose is, isn't just about checking off a few boxes every week. Worshiping with purpose is about the heart behind the worship. I think that's what Isaiah chapter 1 is all about. It's here in Isaiah chapter 1 that Isaiah tells the people of God, he tells Judah, hey, there are three corrections, there are three challenges that God is making to you about your worship. Three different corrections, three different challenges that I think still apply to us today. So let's go ahead and begin there in Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, where Isaiah tells the people of God, Listen, heavens, and pay attention, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have raised children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, 
and the donkey its master's feeding trough. But Isaiah or Israel doesn't know. My people do not understand. O oh, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children, they have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on Him. Why do you want more beatings? Why do you keep on rebelling? The whole head is hurt. The whole heart is sick. From the whole sole of the foot, even to the head, no spot is uninjured. Wounds and welts and festering sores not cleansed, bandaged and soothed with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities burn down. Foreigners devour your fields right in front of you. A desolation like a place demolished by foreigners. Daughter Zion, Isaiah says, is abandoned like a shelter in a vineyard, like a shack in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of armies had not left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would, he says, resemble Gomorrah. The first thing I see here in the text is Israel's spiritual condition, or Judah's spiritual condition, rather, and hopefully the clicker will work. Luke, I think you have the clicker. Will you click for me? Isaiah begins by telling us, listen, he, heavens, pay attention to earth. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, heaven and earth were called witnesses of the covenant between God and Israel. And this was a covenant between God and Israel that, that required exclusive faithfulness. Now, God speaks and tells the heavens and the earth that that Judah hadn't been faithful. Despite everything that God had done for Judah, Judah had rebelled. They weren't listening to God. They didn't know God. And Isaiah there in the text goes on to say there in verse 3 that even oxen, even donkeys, even dumb animals listen to their master. But Israel isn't listening to their master. Israel isn't listening to God. And as we read Judah compared to dumb animals, we may be asking ourselves, have I ever acted this way? Have I ever acted like an ox? Have I ever acted like a donkey? And the answer for all of us is yes. We've all acted like a dumb ox. We've all acted like a dumb donkey. We've all stubbornly rebelled against God. The sad thing is that there are a lot of us today that even though we've been blessed by God, make a lot of dumb, sinful decisions that make a donkey look like a genius. And yet as Isaiah sees Judah's rebellion here in verse 4, he cries out there in the text, You sinful nation, weighed down with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children. I'm sure some of the parents here in the audience have maybe felt that way about their kids at some point in time, or at least some other kids in the Walmart store on Christmas Day. But he cries out at the very end of verse 4, they have despised the Holy One of God. They have abandoned the Lord. Israel had done the unthinkable. They had rejected God and rejected the covenant. So Isaiah turns to the people there in verse 5 and says, Look, guys, look, Judah, look, Israel, look, the people of God. You are beaten. Every part of your body is aching. Every part of your body is sore. Every part of your body has indications that you're facing the wrath of God. Why aren't you getting the picture? Head to toe, you have sores. What aren't you getting? And again, some of the parents here may understand just a little bit about what God is feeling. Because if you're a parent, I guess, I'm going to guess, at least, I haven't gotten to that stage in my life yet, that you've had a time in your life as a parent where you told the kids, don't eat a cookie. And yet, what did they do? They ate the cookie. So you beat them. And then five seconds later, what are they doing again? 
eating another cookie. And so you beat them again. And you say, don't eat the cookie. And what are they doing? They're eating the cookie. And the entire time you're going as a parent, as a mom, as a dad, you're going, what aren't you getting? Don't you realize that the reason you're getting beat black and blue is because you keep eating these cookies? I can't be the only one who had this happen to me. And yet, that's what's happening with the people of God. And so Judah is bruised and battered, and yet despite the beatings, Isaiah says, you're not getting the picture. And because they continue to rebel, look what happens there in verses 7, 8, and 9, that their land is desolate. Their cities are burned down. Foreigners had devoured their fields right in front of you. There was a desolation. Even daughter Zion, even the city of Jerusalem was like a shack in the middle of a field. The whole city, the whole nation had been brought to ruins. That yes, they were wealthy. Yes, they were a prosperous nation, but because they had rejected God, because they had rejected the covenant... With God, they had been devastated. Even Zion, even Jerusalem, the city of the great king, was affected by this destruction. And all of this happened for one simple reason. Israel did not listen to God. They had, in fact, rebelled against God. And this is a warning for all of us. That even though we may be the people of God, that there is this possibility that we may stop listening to the voice of God. And what's even worse is there is this possibility that we may not even know God to begin with. That yes, we may have the Bible on our iPhones, we may have the Bible on our iPads, we may have the Bible at our homes. But despite the Bible everywhere we go we may not actually know the Lord. We may not be listening to what he has to say. That was Judah's spiritual condition. Judah had had God's word revealed to him. Judah had had God reveal his will to them. And yet, despite everything God had done for them, despite the fact that God had said, here's what I want from you, people of God, they had stopped listening And now Isaiah says here in the first nine verses of the book, because you don't know the Lord, because you have rejected the Lord, because you aren't listening to the Lord, you are going to face God's judgment. Your land is desolate. But even when God came in judgment, he he showed grace. He showed mercy there in verse 9 because he preserved their A few survivors. Some translations may actually say a remnant there in the text. Even in judgment, God showed grace. God showed mercy. I want you to keep that in the back of our mind as we we continue to work through the text today. Let's go on and and read there in verse 10 where, where God says in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are all your sacrifices to me? Asked the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, or male goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires this from you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbath, the calling of solemn assemblies. I cannot, God says, stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They have become a burden to me. I am tired of putting up with them. When when you spread out your hands in prayer, I refuse to look at you, even if you offer countless prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. The second correct correction, second challenge for the people of God here in the text is that Judah needs to deal with their hypocrisy. 
Isaiah begins there in verse 2 by calling creation, by calling heaven and calling earth to listen to what God has to say. Now there in verse 10, he says, now Judah, now people of God, you listen to what God has to say because God has a word for you too. He looks at Judah, the people of God, the prophet of God, compares Judah to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were cities so wicked that they were burnt off the face of the map because of their wickedness. Sodom was a city so wicked that even today, even roughly 4,000 years later, we still refer to acts of sexual immorality as acts of sodomy. And yet Isaiah says that's how wicked Judah was. What a shock for the people of God to hear themselves compared to Sodom in Gomorrah. To hear Jerusalem called Sodom, to hear Jerusalem called Gomorrah. And the sad thing about their rebellion is they were still a religious people. Despite their sin, they still came before the Lord. Despite their sin, they still offered sacrifices. Despite their sin, they still came with offerings. And yet, what does God say there in the text? I don't care about your sacrifices. He says, I don't care about your worship. I don't care about your offerings. Yes, they honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from God. Your worship, God says, is useless. It's vain. And quite frankly, God says, I'm tired of your worship. But Isaiah thankfully also explains why there in the text, in verse 13 and in verse 15, why Israel's worship or Judah's worship was rejected. Their worship was rejected because of their sin. The Judah was doing all of the right things, but their hearts were still stained by sin. Their hearts were rotten. You see, sacrifices alone don't please God. The act of worship itself doesn't please God. It is, in fact, possible to worship God in vain. And isn't that a message we need today? That it's possible for us to come to the church building every Sunday and every Wednesday and every gospel meeting and to sing songs of praise, to pray the prayers to God, to listen to sermons, to have our Bibles open, but still have our worship rejected because our hearts are stained with sin. And if our hearts are stained with sin... If our hearts are rotten, then God won't accept our worship. I think that's the idea there in the text in Matthew chapter 5, right smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at this about a week ago. And there in the text, Jesus tells the crowds there at the Sermon on the Mount that if a brother has something against you, if you've sinned against a brother, go take care of it before you offer songs of praise, before you offer sacrifices to God. What Jesus is teaching the crowds, what Isaiah is teaching us here in the text, is that we can't worship God with purpose if sin is present in our life. And that should be a warning for all of us. Because it's easy for us, even today, for our hearts to become hardened to the sin in our life. For us not to realize the sin that is plaguing our soul and to trick ourselves into thinking that just because I sang a song just a few minutes ago, then God is pleased. That as long as I pray these prayers, as long as I sing these songs, as long as I sit in a pew, God is happy with me. That I'm in a right relationship with God. Isaiah makes it clear. God isn't pleased with us if our hearts 
of wor- are, are rotten when we come to worship. But at the same time, I wonder if we've placed so much emphasis on external things, like what we wear, the songs that we sing, and all these external things that we may consider when we come to worship that we've forgotten that worship ultimately, worship with purpose ultimately begins in our hearts. That yes, we may be singing holy, holy, holy. We may be singing hallelujah, praise Jehovah. We may be singing a host of songs and we've got a ton of songs here at Union Road. But if our hearts are rotten, God isn't pleased. And if our hearts and our minds aren't focused on God, then it's not worship. It's hypocrisy. And we're acting just like Judah. So if we want to worship with purpose, then we need to remember that worshiping with purpose starts in a pure and obedient heart. And to be honest, at this point, this is a pretty pessimistic, this is a pretty negative sermon. I really don't like negative sermons. I really don't like pessimism. You guys know me well enough to know that, I think. But this isn't the end of the story here in Isaiah chapter 1, because Isaiah goes on there in verse 16 to say this, Wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. There in verse 18, please key in on this. Come, God says, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing to willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Third thing I see here in the text, the third correction that Isaiah makes, the third challenge for the people of Judah is they needed to be spiritually transformed. Isaiah looks at the people of Judah and says, I know you've been devastated. I know you've been devastated because of your sins. I know you've been devastated because of your hypocrisy. And even though that Isaiah spends the first nine verses blasting Judah for their sin and their hypocrisy, even though he blasts them for their worship there in verses 10 through 15, there there is still hope for Judah. You see, Isaiah doesn't just diagnose their sin sickness. Isaiah also writes a prescription for the cure. And there in the text, beginning in verse 16, the first part of that prescription is they needed to wash themselves. They needed to wash themselves. Not only that, they needed to remove those evil deeds. They needed to stop doing evil. We may say today that they needed to repent. At the center of Isaiah's message for the people of God is a call for spiritual transformation. The solution to Judah's problems wasn't more sacrifices, more offerings, more prayers, more religious activities. The solution Isaiah gives to the people of God so they could worship with purpose is they needed to be spiritually transformed. They needed to have a changed heart. They needed to live faithfully before God. They needed to consider and learn what is good. They needed to correct the oppressor. They needed to plead the widow's cause. They needed to pursue justice. They needed to have a heart that was overflowing with righteousness. What Isaiah tells the people of God here in the text is if they ever wanted to worship with purpose, they needed to fix their heart. Because genuine repentance is shown 
by radical transformation in all areas of our life. But how in the world could a people so sick, how in the people in the world could a people so sinful, how could they have a changed heart? Verse 18. God. God is how they could have a changed heart. And honestly, that's what makes verses 16 through 20 such an incredible message for even us today. That even though we have sinned, even though we have fallen short, even though our hearts are stained, there is still hope. God stands ready to accept our worship. If only we will turn to him. If only we will change our hearts. This is so important for us today. That if we ever want to worship with purpose here as a church family at Union Road, then it's going to start in our heart. Our hearts individually and collectively must be changed. But how is that even possible? How can sinners like you and me, how can we have a changed heart? How can we be cleansed from the stain of sin? And again, verse 18, look what it says. Come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as crimson, they will be as wool. The cleansing that we need, the changed heart that we need comes from God. It starts with an invitation from God himself there in the text. It begins with come. God is inviting us to come to him. And God goes on there in verse 18 to say, let's settle this. That's courtroom language. There's a conflict between us and God. That's courtroom language. And so as we approach the judge of the entire universe, knowing that judgment awaits us, here in verse 18, the judge of all the universe doesn't pronounce judgment. He pronounces pardon. That even though our sins are red, even though our sins are like scarlet, Isaiah says they can be made white as snow. A lot of the mamas here, a lot of people who do laundry, know how hard it is to get red out of clothes. Red stains are nearly impossible to get out. And yet God can cleanse, God can wash away the filth of sin, the redness, if you will, of the stain of sin. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of the cleansing God provides. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. You know, it's hard for me as I read verse 18 not to see Christ here in verse 18. Because in Christ, God doesn't just cover up the stain of sin. He washes the stain of sin away with the blood of Christ that he shed on the cross. That because God loved us so much, he sent the Lamb of God into the world to shed his own blood, to give his own life there on the cross to take away our sins. God paid the price to cleanse us from sin. So if we want to worship God with purpose, we need the cleansing that God provides. And so what do we do today? How can we prepare our hearts to worship God with purpose? Well, I see three things there in verse 16 to 20. Three really quick commands. First thing I see is that we need to Repent. 
Verse 16, the second part, remove your evil deeds. We need to repent. There in verse 17, we need to trust in God's way of doing things. We need to trust that learning to do what is good is the right thing to do. We need to pursue justice. We need to correct the oppressor. We need to trust God's way. But the third thing I see there in the text is we need to be washed. We need to be washed there in verse 16. We need to be cleansed from the stain of sin. And that's something only God can do, and he does it through the blood of the Lamb. Verse 19 and 20, though, lay a choice before all of us. That even now, even today, 27 or so hundred years after Isaiah writes, there's a choice before all of us here today. That if we are willing and obedient, we will enjoy the blessings that God has provided for us. We'll enjoy that home in heaven. We'll enjoy fellowship with our maker. But if we refuse, if we continue to disobey, we will be devoured, he says, by the sword. That choice is before all of us this morning. If you're here and you recognize there's a sin in your life, and you've come and you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, those sins have been washed away, but you need to make things right. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you to make things right with God. But maybe you're here and your sins have never been washed away. Your sins are as scarlet, but even this morning, they can be made as white as snow. Are you ready for your sins to be washed away? If you are, please let us know. While together we stand and sing.